So welcome, okay. welcome, Thank Mahim. You. Yes, let's, let's begin now. Thanks. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, putting this together and uh, <coughs> inviting me to be here. It's nice to be in New York again. Um, <coughs> uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about the uh, work of my um, recent student, Wei-Tang Jin, <coughs> though it'll include also um, um, some collaborative work over the last uh, couple of months since he, since he finished. Um, and uh, like the previous two talks, um, I am uh, uh, also going to be considering um, certain order two differential equations um, in, a, in a single variable. Um, but, uh, but unlike uh, the previous two talks, um, these will be equations that are sort of of the opposite kind. So um, where you don't get uh, misintegration or uh, strong normality, um, <clears throat> uh, you get um, things that are uh, very close to the constants, very, very much, so not orthogonal to the constants, but very much built up from the constants. So um, <clears throat> we consider the, uh, uh, the logarithmic derivative. So, well, so first I work in uh, <laughs> Um, some large um, differential equals sphere, characteristic zero, uh, and we let C be the constants, field of constants. Um, and I want to uh, the, the equations we're looking at um, are defined using the logarith logarithmic derivative map. So this is a homomorphism from the multiplicative group to the additive group, um, a delta algebraic homomorphism. <coughs> and it takes an element of 2, uh, delta x over x. Um, <coughs> And the order two equations I'm interested in are uh, built up using, um, using the logarithmic derivative. Um, <clears throat> and so maybe I'll start with looking at three, uh, three examples. So these equations are very simple. They're much simpler than the um, uh, equations we've been seeing in other talks. Um, <clears throat> but they have a lot of interaction with the constants. So uh, let's look at uh, three examples. So the first one is um, a well-known example of a differential algebraic group uh, that you get from, uh, from this uh, homomorphism. So you consider the pullback under the logarithmic derivative map of the constant point. G, we write it this way. Just the set theoretic pullback of the constant points of the additive group under the logarithmic derivative map. So this is defined by uh, the equation delta of delta x over x equals 0. And this is a, uh, um, a differential algebraic subgroup of a multiplicative group. And it admits, um, following the exact sequence, you can restrict the logarithmic derivative map to G. Um, and that goes onto the constant points, and the kernel is the multiplicative constant, which lives inside it. So it's an extension, this differential algebraic group is an extension of the additive constants by the multiplicative constants. So this is what I mean by having a lot to do with the constants. It's built up from the constants. It has an image uh, which lives in the constants, and the fibers are well, multiplicative translates of uh, the multiplicative constants. Sorry, this is, this is just C. Maybe I'll just use C for the constants. <coughs> um, and so it's an example, well, model theoretically, we would say this is too analyzable uh, in the constants. So you can get it from the constants via fibration, where the image uh, lives in the constants, and the fibers live in the constants. The fibers require parameters to embed them into the constants, because, well, other than the kernel, the, uh, 
you know, the other fibers are going to be <coughs> translates of the constants, possibly by non-constant elements. And uh, a well-known fact uh, is that um, <coughs> is that globally, G is not living in the constant. So particular doesn't split. <coughs> Um, <coughs> uh, in fact, more, um, even if you work over additional parameters, right? So these equations are defined with no parameters. They're defined over the, the rationals, if you like. Uh, even if you work over uh, additional parameters, G is not um, generically in finite to finite correspondence with, say, an algebraic variety in some affine space over the constants. Yeah, so there's no, um, it's not a finite cover of. Uh, um, some constant algebraic variety, uh, nor the image of a finite cover under a finite map uh, of the constant algebraic variety, also using additional parameters. Maybe it's worth, most people know this fact, but let me uh, call the proof, or a proof, which is that if it were, then well, for differential algebraic groups, if they are, yeah, by the way, I should give a name to this, which we've seen um, people use already. So I, this, this property of uh, not being, well, or of being, so, so it's not uh, almost C eternal. Yeah, that's the model theoretic terminology. I'll actually drop the word almost as to the fact that I'm not talking about definable bijection, but a definable finite to finite correspondence. But I'll, I'll always be talking about that, so I'll drop the word almost and talk about C internality. <clears throat> um, as, to mean this property of coming from the constants in this sense. Being in finite to finite correspondence with something in the constants using additional parameters. If it were, then in, because this is a differ differential algebraic group, uh, it would actually then be isomorphic. Definably isomorphic to the constant points um, where H is an algebraic group over the constants. But in algebraic geometry, you don't have any non-trivial extensions of the additive group by the multiplicative group. So you would get that H is, does split. And so <coughs> pulling back to G, you would have that G has uh, a delta algebraic subgroup so G is isomorphic to the C points, so it has uh, a subgroup that's a copy of the constant additive group. And so now by an old theorem of Phyllis's, right, that the uh, in a in a differential algebraic subgroup, the multiplicative group, right, this is living inside the multiplicative group. <coughs> if you have an infinite definable algebraic subgroup, then differential differential algebraic, differential algebraic subgroup. Then, uh, then it must contain the, the C points of GM. And so in particular, it can't be torsion free. You can't have a copy of the other. Uh, so that's, let's see, for example, if this doesn't split. OK, um, so the second example is um, instead of pulling back uh, the constant points, which you know are defined by delta x equals zero, what if we pull back the equation delta x equals one? Okay. So I call this D. It's a, it's a subset of the, the additive group. It doesn't live in the constants directly, but it is internal. Uh, it's a it's an additive an additive translate of the additive constants. So it, is, it does live in the constants once you name the, pr the translating parameters. So it's an example of something that's internal. Uh, and you could consider C 
set X, which is the inverse of the set pullback of D under this. So this is defined by saying instead of in the previous example, look at this equation, very similar situation, but equal to one rather than zero. <coughs> And, well, there might be various ways of seeing this, but in any case, it appears in um, another part of the thesis, wherever they work, that uh, this has the same property, x is not C internal. It's still two-step analyzable, right? You don't have an exact sequence, you're not working with uh, differential algebraic groups, but you do have a vibration. You can restrict the logarithmic derivative to x, and it will go to d, and this thing, after, after working over additional parameters, does live in the constants. And the fibers, again, are translates of the multiplicative constants. So the fibers also live in the constants. <clears throat> so it's built up from the constants, the order two equation, uh, and it's built up from the constants. But it does it globally. So it's two-step analyzable, but it's also not internal. But, but it must be very close to this example. It's very close to it. I mean, uh, no, it's not, I don't know if it's very close. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. I mean, yeah, so, um, I, uh, yeah. Jim gives an argument. It's not. It's not very. It's not very far from this. You mean the argument's not very far? From this? Well, the yeah. argument is different because uh, well, you don't. Yeah. So you don't have groups, so you can't use this sort of group theory, different yeah. an algebraic group argument. Pretty but fair. actually, there's lots of hands-on proofs of this. But you can prove this yeah, just by hand, and you can prove that by but hand. It's a coset of. Them. But it's a coset. But it's not. I mean, it's not a coset of G. No. No, a coset right. of G. It's just built up. Yeah, you know, the base is a coset, so it changes. The situation a little bit, but not, not not too much. Yeah. By the way, these are, all three examples are, are are easy. I mean, not this one's well known, and the other ones require much work. I'm just trying to motivate uh, the question. Um, so no. He, so Jin just shows this by hand that this is not not symmetric. It actually follows from the theorem. I'll say as well that this would be done directly by hand. Okay. So this is again uh, a situation that's built up, but isn't uh, itself. <coughs> um, we do a third equation, third example, which again looks very similar. So instead of uh, uh, of d, let's consider something that's definably isomorphic to d, it's called e, just the reciprocals. Right, so this is defined by the equation delta x equals minus x squared. Derivative, the, derivative, the, the derivative of 1 over x is 1, rather than the derivative of x is 1. So the derivative of x is minus x squared. So this is defined in the isomorphic. D, so of course it's also still internal. Um, but if you consider y to be the pullback of E, so you pull back <coughs> this set then it is internal. It is globally internal. It's not just built up from something internal. It is built up from something internal. Again, you know, you have the same picture here. So by the way, this is therefore defined by the derivative of x over delta x is equal to minus, is equal to one. Uh, um, and you have, uh, you know, you have the same situation you restrict the logarithmic derivative map to y. And this guy is internal because it's finally a more isomorphic to d, which itself was a translate of the other constants. Um, <coughs> and the fibers, I'm pulling back always by the logarithmic derivative map, so always the fibers are going to be translated to the multiplicative constants. So it's fibered in two steps with things that are very close to the constants if you allow additional parameters, but the total space is not close to the constants, even if you or is in this case is C internal, um, and you can see this just explicitly um, because you can look at, uh, it's actually isomorphic to D, that D, uh, across um, the additive uh, constants, I guess, um, by the map that takes it. Well, we don't have to get to D. <coughs> Take the logarithmic derivative, that lands you in E, you, you, you take the reciprocal, you get an element of D, and you just have to compute. <coughs> so you just check 
that if x satisfies this equation, then delta squared x is zero. So delta x is actually a constant. And then you check that this is an isomorphism. So it is, globally, it splits, right? And it's that it, these both parts are internal to the constant, so y is internal to the constant. So something different happens, <coughs> even though the change is quite small. I mean, the base so is t a cross, decimal. With t cross gm. Uh, no, I think I mean. T here. cross gm. Right? Right? Uh, is it gm? Yeah, because ah, yeah. at the yeah. deducers. No, GM is the, GM is the, GM. Uh, GM is the, it's the kernel, so you pull it back, then you get, sorry. Yeah, yeah the, the, the fibers of this map are, uh, yeah, GM, so you're yeah, right. The vibration is, the vibration. Yeah, yeah. delta x can be zero. Yeah, the point is that it's a constant. The second derivative is a constant, so the derivative, uh, as the second derivative is zero, the derivative is a constant. So the, what we're trying to do, maybe I shouldn't write all the way here, it's okay, yeah, is uh, explain why. Right? So you know, explain this sort of difference. I mean, <clears throat> why does it sometimes give you, um, uh, why is the pullback sometimes internal and sometimes not internal, even with what are um, minor, what look like minor changes to the equations. So, <clears throat> Uh, more generally, the general question here is the following. Um, <clears throat> so I also don't want to just work over constant parameters. So uh, let's say we're given any differential field, not necessarily constant, <clears throat> not necessarily living in C, and work over K. And suppose we're given a base equation very much like the three equations we've seen here. Uh, namely, we have some rational function over k, and we consider um, d, I'll call it d, it's not that d, it's a generalization of these three d's, uh, the equation given by uh, delta x equals f of x. So looking at this over one equation on the affine line, but possibly with non-constant parameters, so the question is, given this setup, um, when is the pullback? It's log delta inverse of d, c internal. Now we know that it can't be a property intrinsic to d, because in example three, we have something that's defined as isomorphic to d, and the pullback is different. So it's something about, you know, it's not, it's not, it's, the question is not invariant under change of coordinates of the base. So this really has something to do with the presentation of D. And I've chosen um, equations that look like this because then you can just simply ask the question about F. Right? So, so what condition on F? So this is in the spirit of this Rosalicht criterion, right? which is for when is D itself internal. Right? Here I didn't, in this setup, I haven't assumed that D was internal to constants. I just took an arbitrary equation of this form. And there's a criterion of Rosenlicht, right? That has just to do, in the case, yeah, so, um, so I'll state the condition more properly later, but uh, um, <coughs> when k is in the constants, um, um, we have a condition on f, and by condition I mean just something about its the algebra of this rational function field. Something about, it's a rational function, something about the shape of the rational function um, uh, for D to be seen to. It's Rosalind wouldn't have said it this way, it was something about, um, about having the first integral, but possibly over additional parameters. And in that case, is it still almost internal? Yeah, I guess it's, I, I really mean, I, all, all throughout I mean almost, so. Um, the condition is for non-orthogonality. It's actually for non-orthogonality, but D is, uh, is order one, so that's the same as almost C internality. So I'm saying C internal just to not have to say almost all the time. Yeah, yeah so 
one has this question of d, but what we're asking for is somehow more, right? We're asking for not just when is d internal, I'm going to be interested in the case when d is internal, but when is the pullback? When is this also internal? But still a condition on d. I mean, the only data involved, I mean, you know, this is determined by f. So you, can, you should expect there to be some condition on f, which makes this c internal. So I'm not interested in the, Rosen, I mean, in the Rosenlicht criterion of when d is internal, but when is a pullback internal? So, well, the first obstacle is, as I said there, uh, Rosenlich's theorem itself. Even, of course, that's a necessary condition. For the pullback to be internal, the image has to be internal. Yeah. Yeah. May I ask, so, uh, just you mentioned that uh, the Rosenlich statement was about first integrals. So can you say something about first integrals of the equations you have, like in example three? So since it's, it is internal, is it true that the equation has first integral? O over additional parameters. Over additional parameters. Yes. So it's, 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 it's change. Equivalent. Yeah. It's okay. Almost, almost internal. Oh, no, not for y. For d, it's equivalent because d is order 1. D is a, is a, is a minimal uh -huh. set. And, and so what, for, what can you say about y? So y is stronger than that. Um, uh, right? You, you know that y has a first integral over additional parameters just from this map here. Right? Uh -huh. Over parameters, this goes in the constant. So you already have. Ah, but, but by order 2, I get it's like n is equal to 2, so I have two independent integrals or something. Yeah, something like this, exactly. I see. Two independent integrals. Um, <coughs> yeah, so now this, this um, is of course an essay condition. For this to be in C internal, D must be. Um, and so in order to answer this question, we have to use Rosenlich's criterion. But Rosenlich's criterion is for constant parameters. And as far as I know, we have no, we have no analog of Rosenlich's criterion when you're not over constant parameters. So the problem, one problem, is that there's no, by the way, I can just say that the, 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 the condition is that one over f is either an antiderivative or an antilogarithmic derivative. That's the condition. One over, d will be internal if and only if one over f is an antiderivative of something in the rational function field kx, yeah. or the antilogarithmic derivative. It'll, I'll write it down, and boy, it'll come up this way. Uh, so there's no analog, no known. There must somehow be, right? Uh, in the sense that it is determined by us, so, but no analog <coughs> of, uh, of Rosenlich's criterion for non constant parameters. Okay, so I will only be able to answer that question uh, in the way I've stated it here under the assumption that k is in the constant, so that I can use Rosenlich's criterion for d, and then ask the further question about log delta. We're really interested in the further question of the pullback, not about d being internal, but of pullback being internal. So if to answer that as a condition on f, as an algebraic condition on the rational function f, to answer this question um, <coughs> the way we'd like to answer it, at the moment, we can only do it for constant parameters. And that will follow. So, as stated, or as asked, uh, we can only answer when k is in the constants. But this will follow from a general statement, a general characterization which is the main theorem. So by general, I mean not necessarily over the constants, um, uh, you know, of a different sort. It's not a characterization in terms of the, you know, the, of the rational function, what the rational function looks like, but I can give some kind of characterization in the general case, and that's the theorem, which I'll state now. And from the theorem, I'll show how you can answer the question as stated when k is in the constants, <coughs> using the input of Rolstein's criteria. Theorem. So just to um, recall the notation here, so d is defined by delta x equals f of x. f <coughs> is rational function for k. k is a not necessarily constant delta field. Let's actually assume k is algebraically closed for convenience. Algebraic closed set of base parameters. What is capital D? Oh, D is defined by yeah, this. Yeah, D is defined by this. So I mean, so D is just some subset of 
the additive group, if you like, of the affine line. <coughs> defined by that equation. Um, and let's, I'll state it in the following form. Let's take a generic point. So take u in the pullback that's generic over k. So say Colchin generic in this pullback over k. And the statement is that if log delta inverse d is C internal, then we can factor a non-zero integer power um, of u as follows. So u to some non-zero integer k can be written as a product, so this is in GM, right, in the multiplicative group. I can take the power and I can write it as a product of two elements where um, W1 has the property that it is in the field generated by the logarithmic derivative of U, and W2 has the property that its logarithmic derivative is in the base field. So this is really, uh, the both sides work? <coughs> so it's one directional circuit, right? Sorry? It's in one direction. Ah, in one direction. well actually it's in, it's in both, I'll say the other direction. Uh, as stated, it's in one direction because, um, yeah, if you assume in addition that, well maybe I say it now, so uh, if D is C internal, which is of course a necessary condition for the log inverse. I didn't assume that D was internal. If D is internal, this is this character is the characterization. This is sufficient. Actually, maybe I, I give the argument because it explains the statement. So what, what's going on here? You're, you're interested in D. Well, D is just the locus of U. U is a generic point. And you take the K power map. Well, that's a finite to one map. Finite to one onto U to the K which is W1 times W2. So let me write that as the locus of W1 times W2 over K, or the locus of U to the K. I mean the culture locus. <coughs> All the arrows here, so arrows, arrows are dominant sure. delta rational maps. Right, so and D, now. D, D is on the right hand side, yeah? Well, do I don't have a left and right. Um, G, in GA. Yes. Right yes. Yes. Right yes. Yes. So, yes. Uh, so let me let me just keep doing this for a second. I have, this is not finished. I just was telling you what the errors are. What is this map though? This is raising the power k. D is a locus of. Oh. D is a locus of u over k, right? Wait. U is a generic point. There's already a d up there. There's a different d up there. Ah, sorry. Uh, no, I don't mean d. I mean uh, I mean log delta d inversely. Sorry. Of course. Thank you. That's what you meant. Yeah. Yes. I'm on the left hand side here. Yes, not on the right hand side. Right? And now u to, u to the k is w1 times w2. So I have a map from the locus of w1 cross k cross the locus of w2 cross k, just the multiplication map in GM, which goes to uk. This is a dominant rational map because it takes this to the generic <coughs> point of that locus. What is the locus of W1? Well, W1 is is in the rational function, is in the function, is gen, you know, is in the in the field generated by log delta u. And log delta u is in D, because right? u is in the pullback, so log delta u is in D. So this is the image under some dominant rational function of D. Okay? And what about this guy? Well, W2, its logarithmic derivative is in the base field. So that means <coughs> that any two, um, uh, any two realizations of this have a constant ratio. They both have the same logarithmic derivative because logarithmic derivative is in the base. But right? k is constant, you said no. No, 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 I don't mean constant. I mean I'm working over k, so it's in the base field. It's not a constant, but it's in the base field, right? So the logarithmic derivative is in the base field, so the type of W2 yes. over k knows what its logarithmic derivative is. So all the other oh, realizations oh, are the oh, same logarithmic yeah. derivative, I'm sure. which is just saying that this is a translator of the multiplicative constant. Right? This, and this map here is just translating by some non-constant. Right? Yeah, because 
Is that clear? And so, uh, so if I assume that D is C internal, then this is C internal. And this is C internal by this map, shows it. It's just a translate of the multiplicative constant. So this guy is C internal, so this image is C internal, and this is a finite cover, and I allowed, because I'm really working with almost C internal, I allowed finite covers, and so the log delta inverse D is C internal. So that's, a, that's the argument for the sufficiency of this condition. Right. And if you look at uh, the example, that's exactly what happened. In, right? So it's sort of saying that all the examples, at some, in some sense, look like this. Right? We wrote an element of the log delta inverse as a product, x over delta x times delta x. And this right? exactly, exactly this picture, more or less, up to this finite cover. So it's somehow a trivial, right? So the point is that this splitting here Right, is over the base parameters. This is just this, this map is over the base parameters. So already over the base parameters, you if if you are uh, internal, then over already over the base parameters up to finite covers, you're a product. You split as a product. So this is all push map all over k. You don't have to go to additional parameters to do the split. And so the theorem is saying that's the only way. Um, <laughs> the pullback can be a C internal if it's C internal for trivial reasons, in some, in some, in some reasons. or for obvious reasons, because you can just factor the element as a product of things. Okay. So is that statement clear? So in this example, k would be equal to one, w one would be equal to this, w two would be equal to this, f was equal to minus x squared. Yeah, so maybe I should say. Here in these examples, in terms of the setup, right? What are the f's? We had f equal to zero in the first example. In the second example, we had f equal to one, and in the third example, we had f equal to minus x squared. Now those examples were all over the constants, and now if I specialize this, I'll come back to stating something about the proof of this theorem. Um, <clears throat> but let me specialize it to the constants, and if I specialize. living in the constants, we get the following answer to this question. In other words, we get a collision on x, right? So the problem here, it's a characterization, modulo the C internality of D, but the characterization is um, some, it's something about the pullback, right? Rather than being something about D. And we know it can't be something intrinsic about D, but we want it to be something about the, the way D was described. So we want it to be some condition on F. We don't get a condition on F here, we get a condition on um, on you know, generic point of the pullback. But the corollary, we do get a condition on f, which is just the specialization of this theorem. So now I have k inside the constants, and I have a rational function field, and I have d defined by delta x equals f of x. <clears throat> then, when is, this was the original question, except that I'm making this specialization, when is this C internal? Is this thing globally? Uh, it have you know two independent first integrals, if you like. Um, if and only if two conditions. Well, we know one necessary condition is that D should be C internal. So we we give Rosenlick's criterion. Right? We should we should impose Rosenlick's criterion. So that's a statement that one over f. I said it before. One over f is equal to either g prime x or c times g prime x over g of x for some other rational function g over k and some c in k. That was this criterion. It's just something about the shape of the rational function. Right? So the prime here means derivative with respect to x. k, after all, is a constant uh, field here. So that's the derivative. I'm looking at this as differential field with d dx, and prime is the derivative with respect to x. So it's an antiderivative of the nature derivative. So you have to impose that. That tells you that d is. Uh, <coughs> you, you keep calling that an algebraic condition, but that's uh -huh. not what I would call it. Yeah, I don't know if algebraic is right. I just mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what to say. A condition on the rational function, sure. uh, on the rational function field. It's not a. I'm, I'm opposing it to this kind of condition, which is not about uh, about the equation, the form of the equation, but something about the structure of the solution set. Whereas this is something about the thing of the equations as being algebraic. But it also is an algebraic condition if you 
just know how to add and multiply coefficients of your function, you can answer it. Yeah, I guess, I mean, this is in the, the, the algebra in, of this it's, field. It's in mm. the language of this mm. field. Mm. Well, no, I, using the derivative, this field with the, with yeah. the we're taking the derivative by d by dx. So the differential algebraic condition, yeah. but, but, but on this differential field, just the, yeah. the usual differential yeah, yeah, field. Okay. But, but, I mean, but it's also an algebraic condition on coefficients taken no. in k, right? D dx is, I mean, you assume k is over the constants. You don't have any other k. Yeah, so this is, the, this is just the usual derivative, so, you know, you can, you can see why right. you can write right. yeah. yeah, you can but write For it. instance, you, could, you can have an example where when, when a certain coefficient is rational, this condition holds, and when a certain coefficient is irrational, the condition fails. It's not an algebraic condition on the coefficient. Even over the constants? Even over the constants. Oh, even when There's the constants an example of those in the paper. Wow. Even when the constants are algebraically closed? Yeah, that doesn't matter. No. You, you have to do the partial fraction decomposition. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, 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 to answer this question, yeah. you look at the partial fraction. Okay, but this is the base, this is the part that, is no, that, that we know, and now we want to know, well, what more do I have to say about f in order for the logarithmic derivative inverse of d to be okay, eternal? And the thing we need to say more is the following, it's that kx minus e over f of x is equal to, I won't use g again, h prime of x. So this is for some rational function h, k integer on zero, e an element of the base pair. So this is the kind of condition we were after. Something about the form of f as a rational function. Two. Hmm? Two. Yeah. Two. There's so. two conditions, if and only if this and yeah, so this tells you that the base is internal, which you of course need. Yeah. And then this, if you impose further this condition on f, right? So these are both conditions on f. So you have this to make the internal. If you impose this condition on f, then the pullback is internal. And why is that a, why is that a corollary of? Uh... Yeah. So maybe I'll prove it. Corollary. It's not hard. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, one as we've already said, this is just d the c internal. Criterion. So we know that 1 is talking about d, so what about 2? So let's assume 2. So assume you can write f this way, or k times x minus e over f this way. Um, <clears throat> then, and let's take, uh, let's take u in log delta inverse, and we pull back. Generic. Let's let a be the log derivative delta u over u, so this is living inside d. And we know, um, it, we have this rational function h over k, we can evaluate it at a, and we let w1 equal h of a, and we let w2 equal u to the power k, over h of a. Is the idea here that you can change u a bit so that a doesn't become uh, a pole? Because you have to plug it into a rational function. So. Yes, so this is generic over k, so a is generic over k, so it doesn't vanish. So in the general, general f of point that these are, the, the rational functions involved are all defined at a. Uh, so, so w1 then is in this field, that's just equal to a. And w2, you just compute, I'm not going to do it, just compute the logarithmic derivative here. Right? It's k times logarithm u minus logarithm h. So somewhere you take the derivative of h, but that will be d by dx of h times, I value it at a times delta of a, but delta of a is f of a. You just write it out, and you see that this guy is actually equal to e. The e of 2. Right, so I'm assuming two, so I have a k, an e, and an h. And that's where this h, k, and e come from. They come from this two. So actually, now we're exact, and, and u 
is, is u to the k is equal to w1, w2. So I'm really using, using the reverse direction of the theorem, which I proved here. So I've written u to the k is a product, and w1, w2 satisfy the conclusion, so by the sufficient direction. log delta inverse of d is c eternal. That's one direction. If I assume two, I do get that the product is eternal. Put it together. I, I, written, I wrote it as a product, and now if you look at this diagram, and you see that log delta inverse has to be, has to be c eternal. What about the converse? So suppose it is internal. I need to prove condition two. Yeah, so is that, is that clear? So, so this, this condition, one tells me d is internal, two tells me that I can split u, uh, did I erase it? Uh, yeah, oh no, it's here. I can split a power of u, which power? It's the same k. Right? I can split that power of k into a product of two elements, satisfying the, the required properties of those two elements. And those properties by the converse direction of the theorem, which is also true in return over there, under the assumption that d is internal, the converse is true, uh, I get that this guy's internal. So now let's do uh, the converse, so let's assume log delta inverse of d is the internal. Right? <coughs> well, then uh, d must be c internal, so 1 has to be satisfied, and I'm going to get 2 from the theorem. Theorem, I have u to the k is equal to w1 times w2. Where w1 is in k of in k of a. A is a logarithmic derivative of u. And the logarithmic derivative um, of w2 is in k. That's what the theorem gives me. So now this is a rational function, so let's write it as h of a, where h is some rational function over k. So I have my h, I need uh, a k, I have a k coming from the theorem, and my e is going to be log delta of w2. And now you just compute ka minus e over f of a, right? I have this, uh, <coughs> now you just, check that this is equal to uh, h prime of a over h of a from this equation. Now this is for some a, but a was, was transcendental, so I get this at the level of the function fields. So kx minus e over f of x is equal to h prime of x over h of x. So it's just some computation from the statement. It's not. It's really just a matter of taking the statement of a the theorem, specializing over. Co I use that over the constants in various places. We use it for a Rosenlich criterion, and we use it in these computations because then the, der the derivative of h of a is h prime of a times delta a, right? because you're working over a rational function over the constants, and so that's how you compute derivatives of rational functions over the constants. So, <clears throat> um, and it doesn't work. Uh, and for that reason, it doesn't work for a general constants. This theorem is still true, but it's hard. And all you need to answer, you can make an analog of 2, you can write down. An analog of this splitting as a, as a property of f, you can write down. It's more complicated. It'll involve the derivation on the base field. Um, but what's missing is an analog of 1, the Rosenlich criterion, for just the base being the, uh, the missing thing to the general question. So let me just say a word um, <coughs> about uh, uh, proof. Yeah. Uh, so, but are there examples for the Lick criterion over non-constants where this not of these two forms? Not of which two forms? Oh, uh, this two. It was a Lick criterion. So. Ah, yes, yeah, yes. So it's uh, so it's uh, it's false. So what these what 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 these two forms tell you mm -hmm. is that the is that the binding group is either the additive or the multiplicative group. And uh, the binding group could be a higher dimension. When you're not over the constants. See, over the constants, ah, ah, so over the, constants the binding group is, is going to be mm -hmm. um, uh, additive or multiplicative. 
but, uh, but uh, if you're not over the constants, there's no reason why it should be dimension one. If it's dimension one, it's enough. I guess there's an elliptic curve case, which you can rule out probably because I wrote the equation like this, so this is on a genus zero curve. So you can't get elliptic curve as the binding group. So in the dimension one case, you get, and that's really what's happening in Rosenick's theorem. You're over the constants, so the, the, the binding group has to be dimension one, and, uh, and this forces it to be either GA or GM, and this corresponds to GA, this corresponds to GM. But when you're not over the constants, the binding group could have dimension two and dimension three. And, ah, so the, and the right Jim writes, examples. Right yeah, so yeah, Jim uh, found explicit uh, examples in both dimension two and dimension three. Maybe in dimension three, he talked to you. You, you but, this is, but this is binding group of the uh, of the base D. What's yeah. The so group? ah well yeah. So I'm, I want to say a few words about the proof, which is exactly the, that's how yeah. the proof goes. Yeah. So yeah. let me just say I mean, this is the fundamental of the fundamental system. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, Could you recall the definition mm -hmm. of binding group? It's the Galois group. Yeah, it's the Galois group. It's not. It's the yeah. It's the Galois group. Here we have internality. It'll generate a PV extension. This is the solution which are PV extension and, and it is the, it's the PV group. So we think of it as automorphisms of the differentially closed field, right. which preserve the constants pointwise, right, and act on the solutions, on, on the solution set. And that group is going to be an, uh, uh, an algebraic group in the constants. And so you get an uh, associated algebraic group in constants, it's the, it's the Galois group. It's the constant points, I guess, of the Galois group. Um, but actually, yeah, right. So, so, but, but Galois group of what? It's of D here, right? So, the, so ingredients of proof of the theorem. Uh, um, um, so it goes by analysis of the binding group. So D here is C internal, right? I've already assumed, let's assume that D is C internal. I have, yeah, I'm in the case with D is C internal. So when you have a C integral of binding groups, I, I, mean, I always get confused with the precise connection. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's somehow morally the same as a differential Galois group. But of what field extension exactly? Yeah. yeah, but you cannot assume that D is C internal in your group. D is defined over, D is defined over what? Can so, Sorry, let me just sorry, sorry, ask sorry, sorry. Uh, to Hans this question. So I'm assuming that log delta inverse D is internal. Okay, yeah, right. Then. So it's necessary yeah, that yeah, D is internal. Sure, sure, sure. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm trying to answer Phyllis's question better uh, about what the binding group is. You're by, in the case by, of, by passing it along. You're in the case of K and C. Yes. No, uh, this is uh, ingredients of proof of K. This is a theorem. No. Of the theorem. Yeah. yeah. So K is not uh, K is not. You can assume K algebraically closed. Yeah, you assume K is algebraic closed. I have an internal. Okay, so first of all, there's several. Okay, so there are some reductions you have to do. It wasn't internal; it was almost internal. You have to replace it by something that's internal, and then um, uh, it might be actually it might not be weakly orthogonal. Right. So the, hmm? the, the, it might not be weakly orthogonal. The binding group, the binding group could be trivial or something. Yeah. So so you have to reduce. You have to, you have to reduce to. Um, so let me call the binding group G. So this group G, the binding group here, G, is the constant point of some algebraic group, H, over the constants, and it acts, H acts on D. This is coming from the internality. Whenever you have an, um, an internal set, you have a, a, a set that's internal to the constants, you have um, an algebraic group in the constants that acts on the set. Uh, you can reduce reduce to the action being transitive. That corresponds to D being weakly orthogonal. You have to deal with the non-weakly orthogonal case separately. Okay, so um, right. So you can you can assume that this thing is internal but not weakly orthogonal. It has it has an infinite an infinite binding group, and then. You're in a situation where there's a lot of general classification, right? We have a, uh, we now have a strongly minimal set, D, being acted transitively by some algebraic group, and we know exactly what the possibilities are. Right? So let's call, so 
old classification in, in the very general setting of stable theories or something for strongly, for strongly minimal homogeneous space. What are the possibilities for an algebraic group acting on a strongly minimal set transitively? Well, uh, first of all, the dimension could be one. So then G is GA of C or GM of C. The only other option, of course, is the elliptic curve, which is ruled out. Why? By, this, by the, fact that, um, the fact that I'm always working with an equation like this. So this, this D is living on, an, on, an, on, a, on a rational, on a genus zero curve. What about the almost internal? Yeah, so you have to do something to reduce the almost internal. You can, it, it, it works. So you have to reduce the actually internal living on. Um, uh, two, by the way, it might be true where you replace D by any minimal internal thing, and then you have to consider the elliptic curve case as well. It's very possible that we expect the theorem to be true of the methods uh, involve this. So, dimension two, well, in that case, as a classification, we know precisely what it is. It's, uh, it's the semi-direct product. I don't remember which way you write this. So I mean, I mean the matrices A, B, 0, 1. That's, that's what the group has to be. It comes from the general classification. This is the classification of homogeneous spaces where D is strongly minimal, right? So this guy is strongly minimal. This is an order of one internal equation. Strongly minimal. Uh, and then three uh, is the dimension. It's three. And then we also know what the group is. It's, uh, it's PGL two. So we have an explicit description of what the binding group is. And the proof, which is somehow much harder than it should be, so I expect that there's a higher level proof, is to just prove it in each case. So these are, these are all conditions on B. These are all conditions, right? These are cases uh, about, about D, the base. The three possibilities for the base. And then, um, of course, we want to look at the logarithm inverse of it, and we use the nature of the binding group in order to answer the question. Right? So, uh, we look, so in each case, there's a hands-on, somewhat technical yeah, argument right. in each case, all of them being difficult as far as, as, far as I can tell. Uh, and in each case, we can produce this splitting. So assuming, for example, in this assuming, case, this is already done by Jim in this thesis. Assuming, assuming, in inter assuming internality of log, assuming internality of that pullback. So you're, you're assuming yes. log, uh, Internality of the pullback. And, and you have to look, look at the group, look at the group too? Uh, yeah, you, you are comparing that group to that group. Yeah, exactly. And it? there's probably some, there's probably, I mean, we can sort of, you know, so we, we're, we're, we're not considering it complete because we think there should be, uh, so maybe, maybe there's some way, I mean, there's some clear patterns actually in the proofs. Well, it's like a pre of a homogeneous space, right? This is a homogeneous space, a pre yeah. homogeneous space. And yes. It's very group. Uh, it's very group like already. Yeah. So, and for that to be. Yeah. But we really use this classification. So not 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 uh, not. Really? Yes. We use the fact that the binding group of D has to be one of these three. We we tried hard to do it in general. So when I say I think we might be able to do it at high level, I still mean using these three. So a uniform proof in all three cases because there seem to be patterns and maybe there's something going on that should also allow the elliptic curve here, which would allow us to yeah. not look at the equation delta x equals f of x, but any order one uh, equation that's internal. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and then to do the three uniformly, but still using the fact that it's, it's bounded by dimension three and that these are the possible. So I'm not really saying anything about the technical art of the proof, um, which has to do uh, with, uh, with studying those three, uh, those three cases. Dimension one, by the way, is exactly this condition this is when Rosenlich's condition holds. Even though I were non-consistent parameters, yes. if you have mentioned one, then Rosenlich's condition is holding. Right? And, uh, and then uh, this is where it started. This is what, what Jin, uh, my student, Rajan, first proved uh, in his thesis. And we've now extended it to uh, the other two cases. Um, and uh, right, and also got this, uh, for, in the, over the constant case, got, obtained this form, formulation. Um, 
in this formulation of this condition. Where is a good exposition of the binding group as it relates to the differential Galois group? Yeah. Was yeah. hmm? that book? Was that book? Was that book? Yeah. The book group was book? Was group? Was that group? Yeah, maybe, no, but, but maybe not the most friendly. But, uh, no, in, ter in terms of connecting with. Oh, but it's, Conne but, connected to differential Galois. Maybe you do it in, in your it, differential it, Galois theory. It's not so good for differential Galois. To, to see the connection with the differential Galois theory is a bit. Uh, Where do you put to see the connection with differential Galois theory is maybe it's quite hard to get. So it's somehow the differential Galois theory of this equation, right? Yeah. It's the differential. Yeah. It's yeah. a different. Is it not just the differential Galois group of this equation in some sense? Well, it's not linear. Oh, it's, it's not linear. It's not linear. It's not Of course. So this is in the. This is in the generalized. Oh, well, this is generalized. No, it's not linear. But in fact, in fact, you could rewrite it as a linear. Right? You can rewrite some other associated linear equation. Yes. Which, such as the solutions of this, are contained in the solutions of. It defines what closed solutions of that or something like that. Ah, okay, and then reduce it. So it's a, the connection is is somewhat mediated. But uh, her question about a good source, you couldn't think of one? Uh, a good source? To explain the, the, the relation between these two notions. Uh, oh, God. Yeah. yeah. It won't be very friendly. Okay. Stable groups. Stable groups. Stable groups. Oh, okay. yeah, I have that. I mean, it was the motivation for, for the binding group, right? <laughs> the binding groups arose. What? To give a model theoretic understanding of differential no. gamma theory. Really? Oh. No, it arose with Zilber for some other reason. He wasn't. Okay. But then Poisson later on used, uh, used that theory to help understand, uh, to, to, redo different, to redo differential gamma theory. Okay. But it, so it, it, not it, right it, at the beginning. It arose it first in pure model it. theory coming out of, of Boris Zilber's yeah. work. On some very but a big part of the development of the theory was, later on, was later understanding later on, yeah. the information. Right. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thanks again.